Welcome to SharePoint Conference North America 2019 in Las Vegas. I'm Rakesh Chincheri from Preventech. Come and join me in a session that talks about transition from non-Microsoft platforms onto Microsoft 365. Um, here you will learn how to move from platforms like IBM FileNet, Documentum or OpenText, understand what the typical challenges are uh, in moving between these two platforms and what needs to be done to ensure a successful migration. Come and join me at the session. What I'm planning to talk today is uh, how to optimize your transition. So the transition is not just about taking the data and dumping in one location, but it is making sure how you can make the best out of this, uh, of this new system and how you can do that more effectively. So my name is Rakesh. Um, I'm the CTO of a company called Preventech that specializes in enterprise migration. So the reason I'm, I thought I'd choose this topic is this is something I've been doing for a long time. I've been working with various ECM platforms, so the likes of OpenText eDocs, IBM FileNet, uh, Meridio, iManage, Documentum. So this has given me a lot of insight into how these systems work. And moving on to SharePoint, I've seen a lot of differences, which a lot of people are not aware of. And understanding these differences and the challenges will make you uh, the, the whole transition a lot more smoother. So what we're going to talk about today is in three main parts. So why, first of all, consider a move from traditional ECM? So these well-established ECM, why should you even think of moving out of that? And what the main differences are, now that you've made up your mind that you want to move to M365, what, what these differences are and how you can mitigate some of the risks there? and the best practices for moving to M365. So we'll split into these three topics. And meanwhile, if there are any questions, um, we can obviously wait for the end, or if there are anything specific, feel free to shout out. So why move from traditional ECM to M365? So we'll get a brief history. Uh, now, I thought I'll touch upon this because some of, if many of you have been working with the system, so you know the history of that. Uh, I'm keeping this session in mind that some of you might have, might not, or might not have worked with some of these traditional ones. Uh, you might be more focused on SharePoint. You might have come across a new ECM now and would be interested in knowing what it is. So if you look at the past, we always had the most traditional ECM, you could say, is how the Egyptians probably stored the data. And the retention policy, I'm sure nobody can beat that. It, it, it is still uh, around today. But if you look at the proper ECM, the way it started, the popular ones in the late 80s, the, the 80s and 90s were the FileNet, Hummingbird, Document, and there was Talent, iManage, and a lot of these systems over time had acquisitions, they got rebranded, uh, you know, FileNet got picked up uh, by IBM, then uh, in the world of iManage, it went through a lot of acquisition, if you look at Hummingbird, it started evolution as PC Docs, eDocs, Hummingbird, then OpenText acquired it. So everything you see here has gone through a lot of acquisitions and companies have taken them. And for one reason or the other, they've decided they don't want to continue investment in that. And that's one of the reasons why people look at moving out of these systems. So post the 2000 era, the likes of Oracle, OpenText, IBM, they started picking up all of these other platforms, and they became very popular. But that's the time when SharePoint evolved. evolved. So if you look at the timeline, in the 80s, the SharePoint wasn't very really, uh, popular. But from realistically from 2003 onwards, that's when uh, people started using SharePoint. Obviously, there was an incarnation of SharePoint before that. People who had abused uh, the, um, I think, the, um, the Microsoft servers and uh, uh, the WSS and things, but properly from 2003 onwards, people started using. SP 2007 was when uh, it started becoming more and more popular, a lot of organizations started using it, and then back in 2010, that's when SharePoint got released as a major platform. So that was exactly 10 years ago in Las Vegas. Uh, so how many of you were here for the 2010 release in Las Vegas? Oh, so one person there. Um, so, you would have seen that Microsoft released it with a big uh, announcement. Uh, there was a major uh, change compared to 2007, a lot of new features. And then it evolved into the 2013 platform, and that's when the online um, started with a big pause. 
going into SharePoint, uh, the Office 365, and then it evolved into 2016 and Office 365. So there was a parallel uh, online and an on-prem evolving, and Microsoft switched their strategy to have more online emphasis. So all the development started happening more on online, and in 2019, they started pushing it down from online to on-prem because there were still uh, on-prem users today. But what happened is, uh, while this was happening, the other museum platforms were quite strong in what they did on the document management side, some on the records management side. So softwares like Meridia was very strong on records management, um, whereas Documentum, they targeted life sciences at the document management side. So they had their niche, they had their um, you know, different features that were available, and that wasn't fully available in SharePoint um, at that point. SharePoint was a basic document management system to start with, but you would have noticed in the last few years it was evolved quite a lot. I think especially with the Office 365 environment coming in, where it is not just SharePoint, but the rest of the services, and we'll have a brief look at that later. It became a lot more mature and people started taking it more seriously and the transition from one of those other platforms into SharePoint was a lot more viable. But that wasn't with any challenges. Now if you look at the Gartner quadrant, in, back in 2008, those were the popular, some of the names seem to have disappeared as you come here, but the main ones like the Oracle, Microsoft, OpenText, IBM, they still remain, and Microsoft has been doing exceedingly well here in the 2018. So 10 years on, SharePoint has evolved quite a lot, and uh, so has even the terminologies. So Gartner used to have ECM as the terminology, and now they are transitioning more into content services rather than calling it the enterprise content management. That's because a lot has changed around that. So, just to make a difference between the old and the new or the different type of houses that we're picking up. So those who know about the Tudor homes, which was popular in England back in the 1500s, 1600s, that was still a house. And modern house is still a house. So what is different? And if you look at it, what is different between one of those traditional ECM and what we call as a modern ECM or a SharePoint? So if you look at these two, they solve the same purpose, someone can live there, but there were differences in which, uh, the, the basis on which they were built. So for example, in the Tudor days, if you're not aware, glass was extremely expensive. So they used to have windows that were tiny. Compared to the modern house, it's all built pretty much with glass. If you look in London, the gherkin is just glass because it's a lot cheaper now. The process of building this has changed. It's become much cheaper. Uh, it's completely different. In the older days, there was no machine to cut wood. So if you look at all the houses, they had strange shape. Um, you only get to see those kind of houses here in, the, in Disneyland. But if you're going in England, uh, you walk around in one of those studio villages, you still see these houses. People live there. They are proper hotels, but they have weird shapes. Uh, that's because the infrastructure wasn't there to do that. Uh, whereas nowadays, it's all prefabricated, you just build and uh, just fix up like a Lego um, And This is the reason why you have different type of um, uh, the background with which they evolved, what influenced how they were built, the technology, the availability of material. And this is the same with ECM, because the ECM platform is undergoing a similar change but in a much shorter period of time, not in a four, five hundred, but in a much shorter period of time, where it has changed from someone using standard document management to uh, just create a document and save it, to working more collaboratively with the document. So that is where uh, things are completely changing. So why migrate and what causes, uh, what are the triggers for migration? From what I've seen, with a lot of the customers I've been working with, the end of life is one of the key things. Especially after an acquisition, the new company might not be interested in uh, you know, further investment, and the current versions are coming to an end of life, you would like to upgrade that. Second is license and support costs. Some of the systems are not cheap. It does cost a lot to run. And when you have more than one system, a lot of organizations have Microsoft 365 or Office 365, in, in their environment. 
So the question is, do I need to spend twice the money now to have data elsewhere and also SharePoint, or can I just move everything and consolidate it? So that's where the content consolidation comes into place. And this could also be not just with SharePoint, but if you have lots and lots of systems, it's an opportunity to get everything together and put them in one place. Technology refresh. We have seen time and time again, most people who are using these other platforms to say, oh, the UI is very clunky, I can't really do things very well. What I need is something fresh, something intuitive, something uh, modern. And that is another reason, although the platform might be good, might be solid, it's ultimately the users who use it. So having the right technology uh, refresh sometimes helps things. Governance and compliance, this is getting a lot more um, important. Uh, especially in Europe with GDPR, uh, you have to follow certain rules, the way the data is stored, how it is secured, and that's slowly coming in towards state side. On, on the US, you have uh, other uh, compliance standards, and this is extremely critical for large organizations. In security concern, more and more people are thinking of the cloud, but then how do you secure the data? Just having data in a document library is not sufficient anymore. It's not about just setting up a, a group with permission, but you need to secure the entire environment. Then the next one is cloud-first strategy. Cloud-first strategy is, is the key thing. Any CTO, CIO, they're always looking at how do you make sure that all the strategies now derive from this cloud first. So the monolithic ECM vendors, uh, which in the past the way it was done, they all are changing. Uh, they're changing so that now the content has to be managed from an end-to-end -end cycle rather than being in one particular uh, repository. Also, there is a major technology shift and a cultural shift happening. So technology-wise, you now content services is part of the next wave in ECM. As I was saying, God not necessarily branded that, which is more focused suite of empowered capabilities that than a traditional ECM where you just created documents. This is more collaboration coming in here. Um, in the past, you had, if you look at content management, you had things like document management, web content management, records management, digital assets, collaboration, search, business process, reporting and archiving. So these are the traditional ways of working. You still have them, but what you will notice is the content platform now looks at it a little bit differently. Uh, rather than having just a pure document management, you now look at a content services repository. And content services would be looking at more than one repository, how you integrate that together. Content and collaboration sharing is quite key. That instead of a normal web content management, you now have more of a digital reports, a digital experience management, the DXP side of things. So the old portals, they are all evolving into more of a DXP solution. Um, same uh, with the reporting. The reporting is still there, but there is a lot more emphasis on analytics and insight. You need to know what's happening with the data, especially with such a large amount of data coming up uh, in your organization. What's, uh, where is the data being created? How it is generated? Governance and compliance is still key. Uh, and the business process automation, even in the M365 world, you can see that flow itself is evolving as a, uh, a popular service now. Then information protection is yet another thing. So rather than looking at security as securing a document in a system, you now want to secure your content uh, as the information is shared uh, within the organization as well as externally outside of the organization. And you need something a lot more uh, uh, secure than just standard uh, group-based security. And that's where things like the Azure Information Protection, uh, they come into place. The cultural shift, you would notice that in the past, people had more monolithic um, repositories where um, content would be, for example, if you take eDocs, uh, eDocs would uh, have a library, you would create folders based on departments, everything was inside a single library. Sometimes you have multiple libraries based on the scale or the geographic distribution, but pretty much different departments would have data in a single library. Whereas nowadays it's more distributed. Even the Microsoft, uh, if you look at the information architecture, it's a flat world. 
it's very distributed. Uh, manual reports management was pretty standard, everything was manually tagged. Now, even AIM is saying that you need to go towards a more automated governance because people can't be bothered to go and tag documents individually. This has to be more of an automated process. The governance was again very rigid. It was more driven by IT. Now everything is coming down more to empowering the users. So the governance has to look at things differently. You have to control how the data is created, yet not impede in the way uh, end users would be working with the content. Previously, people had a single device. They would work on their work desktop, but now it's more mobile. Uh, you have multiple devices, and they're working with that. Things were more reactive, as now you have to be upfront, you have to be proactive, uh, stop any problems upfront. And that the traditional enterprise users and the millennial users work very differently. It's the age of Facebook and Snapchat and Twitter, um, so you have to provide the right tools, the right environment, and the right technology, so that particular generation uh, can fit in with the organization. So all of this has to be taken into consideration. And with the content velocity, the way in which the content is changing nowadays, so information, it picks up speed. So this is something which I picked up from one of the Microsoft uh, uh, white paper, where they say that information is picking up speed and relevance as it is created, edited, and reused, and becoming more valuable. So it is not, in the past, you would create a document and store it somewhere, and it is there. People might go and occasionally use it, but now it is a lot more collaborative. Uh, it, the information is constantly being changed, it's being morphed, uh, so the technologies and the system needs to be in accordance with that. So how is it changing? So information control from, coming back to the Tudor analogy, they are, the men in types used to control the information in those days, but nowadays obviously it's all men in tweets. So you can see the government, the people who control information is changing that way, and so is the end users who are using and consuming the information is changing exactly the same way. Now, if you're looking at a transition, if you're thinking of moving from one of these well-established ACM platform, what is it that is important? It has to be driven through some goals. So the users typically need a very seamless transition. They need increased user productivity and a faster access to content. The search has to work quickly. Uh, one thing we always uh, find people telling is, well, I've been trying to find this document. I just can't find it. No idea where it is. And they lose a lot of time. And there are some stats that tells you uh, the amount of billions of dollars that are getting wasted in people trying to uh, find this information. And the, the UI has to be simple and intuitive. End users like a good, simple, uh, intuitive UI. But for the business, there has to be reduction in cost. Any transition you do, it is a major process. It's not a simple thing as you take something, plug it in here, and it works. So there is a, a major cost investment for the business, so it has to deliver a cost reduction. There has to be business continuity, large migrations, <coughs> large transition could potentially stop some of the business process, and that won't be acceptable. There has to be an ROI, the content has to be secure. Mobility is another reason why people might even look at this. Then the IT department, for them, any, any move you make has to result in a better control of the environment, a better control of how things are provisioned, and there has to be an optimization in the various processes. So before we go and look at how you move and what the differences are. What is Microsoft 365? Uh, I come across a lot of people who always ask me, you know, what is the term, what is the difference between Microsoft 365 and Office 365? Uh, a lot of the time there's a, a lot of confusion. Uh, now if you look at all these various uh, services that are available, when you, when you go to your portal.office.com and log in, you might come across all these services, Word, Excel, OneNote, Power BI, SharePoint, OneDrive, Teams, there are too many things. Now, what is O365 and what is N365? So to put it simple, it's the applications that the end user uses on a day-to-day -day basis, the desktop apps like the Word, Outlook, Excel, 
that would be considered as the office apps. So this is what Microsoft originally had. You would install that on your desktop. Then this, they put this layer of Office 365 on top of that, which was for communication, storage, and the online services. So communication through Teams, uh, Yammer, Outlook, um, also Skype, which is now changing into Teams. Uh, <coughs> storage was SharePoint and OneDrive, so your personal data in OneDrive, the rest in SharePoint. And your online services and all the business productivity apps, you had lots of other things, so the Planner, uh, you know, Power Apps, Flow, Power BI, Stream. And then Microsoft 365 is a combination of Office 365 plus your Windows 10. So you're no longer looking at data that is stored in the cloud, but wherever you are on the desktop, they're trying to combine that along with the device management, the EMS suite of products. Um, so the uh, Azure Active Directory Premier, uh, Intune, um, the whole device management, so it goes onto the mobile. So everything that you're using to connect to the enterprise from which you would be creating data, consuming data, modifying data, that's all in a single, um, in, uh, like an ecosystem. So it's easier to manage. You have the sh uh, same services, uh, the same set of uh, single sign-on, so it's much easier to manage. So this is what Microsoft 365 is. Now, this is important. The key differences between ECM and non, uh, the SharePoint and the traditional ECM. So I thought of putting this uh, diagram here just to talk of what are the various entities when we look at things. When you look at traditional document management, there is a file. Uh, and many a times people just look at file as a file and that's it. But if you think of any system, a file has got some binary content. A file will have some attributes. Uh, it'll have a name, it'll have a date when it was created, a user who created it. So that's the system attributes of that particular, or the system properties that you see here. Then the file itself could have multiple versions. So you can have a version one, two, three, multiple versions. Then that set of versions could be classified. You might classify it as a sales document or a finance invoice. It could have a classification. And based on the classification, you will have a bunch of metadata. So if an invoice could have invoice number, uh, the, the date, the supplier, whereas it, if it's a sales document, it could have who the customer is or what the project is or when the, uh, the RFP deadline is, it could be those kind of metadata. So the metadata differs based on the classification. Then in addition to that, you could have variation of the content. So the variation is, one is rendition. So rendition is, a lot of systems supports that, um, where you could have a Word document, and you could create a PDF rendition of that particular file, or a TIFF rendition. So it's the same content, but a different format, and that's a rendition. You could have a translation, and this is common in uh, many multilingual countries, if you go to Switzerland or other countries, Belgium, where content needs to be in, in French, in Flemish, in Dutch, uh, then you need translations of the content. So it is exactly the same file, the same content, but in different language. Then you have relationships. Um, so if it's, let's say, uh, an RFP proposal that you're working on, your document could be related to your pricing document or your other um, your proposal document. So they all get related to each other, but they are separate, distinct, uh, independent documents. Then you can have aggregation. So in aggregation, rather than having just a relationship, you might actually put them together. So for the folks who look at SharePoint, it is the equivalent of having a document set where it does exist together. Whereas with the relationship, the same document could be in a relationship with lots of other documents. Uh, so it's all like a, a web of uh, connection. Whereas with the aggregation, you would put them together and they are in that particular aggregate. So, the reason I put this uh, slide is, so when we are now looking at the rest of the things, we need to see which of these entities can map directly with SharePoint, which might not have a direct mapping, but you could have uh, some kind of an equivalent functionality, and that's a key thing to make sure functionality is not lost. So if you start with versioning, you might think versioning is such a simple thing, just have multiple versions. But if you look at different systems.
Some of them could have simple major versions, version 1, 2, 3. Now, some of them could have minor versions, uh, which is available in SharePoint. So the one below here that you see is a screenshot from SharePoint. One, uh, those three are on top are from FileNet. Um, so within FileNet, you can see there is a major version and a minor version. So 1.1, 1.2, and SharePoint also supports that you have this concept of minor version. But to complicate things, some systems like Documentum, for example, could have a minor version that is uh, more than two levels deep. So you could have 1.4.2.3, uh, whereas within SharePoint, you can only have a 1.2. So this is where some of the challenges start to occur and you need to see how do I not manage this data? Uh, you, could, uh, you could take this over in a few different ways. You could uh, keep the ordinality or the way in which the data is stored uh, in the right way, but the version number could be stored as a method. Uh, by the way, is any Documentum users here? No Documentum, any file net? Yeah. Uh, may I ask which, uh, okay, any open text edocs? No? Okay. Uh, so is it mostly SharePoint on prem? File server. File server. Open text as well, yeah. Oh, open text, okay. Um, yeah, what we see here can be applied to most of the other systems. Because ultimately it is a concept and just knowing how these things can be translated is an important way. Some systems we have seen have got an alphanumeric version. Uh, Edocs, open text Edocs, have got a versioning like 1A, 1B, 1C. Uh, now obviously SharePoint doesn't support a 1A, 1B, so that has to be translated into a 1.1, 1.2. Uh, some have got symbolic version labels, like this is a current, uh, current version, or this is a published version. Um, so those are the additional properties that, are, that have to be taken across in addition to your standard version. Some systems also have a complicated version called branched version. Uh, this is where they might start off in a single line, but then start branching out, and then almost like people who might be doing um, working with uh, source code. Uh, in source code control, you could branch things and merge things and it gets all complicated. That can also happen with document management, management systems. The other factors, yes, another important thing that we constantly see moving over the system is the different file types of the extension. Now, I was surprised with the number of people who didn't realize that in a lot of the systems, you could have the first version of the document as a doc file, and the second version could be a PDF file. Um, and this we see quite a lot, especially when people move from an older version, where back in the 1990s, they used to create a doc, doc file, and then when Word 2007 came out, they all became docx. Yeah, so a doc and docx, it's a different extension, and that can be part of the same version series. Within SharePoint, the extension has to match. It has to be exactly the same. So you cannot have a doc and a docx, or a docx and a PDF as part of the same version series. The other one is a different file name. So if you create a file called uh, uh, report August 2018, and then in December you might have a report December 2018, a lot of the systems allow you to create these uh, uh, versions one after the other with different names. Uh, within SharePoint, you need to have exactly the same name. So you can decide, should you take the uh, first version name, which might work for some of the customers, or should you take the last version name, which also might be possible, but then you need to see if you are planning to change or what you would call as an incremental uh, transition, where you transition some content now using the last version name, that was in December 2018. And then in March 2019, you're doing the final set of things. And your file name is called now March 2019. Do you stick with December 2018? Or now do you rename the document to March 2019? So these kind of challenges need to be taken into account. Classification. Now, fortunately, classification is probably one area where SharePoint is very strong. So you could pretty much take most of the uh, classification from other systems uh, into SharePoint very easily. Um, 
most of the systems like here, this is again a screenshot from FileNet. It shows you how you can have document classes, uh, which is a hierarchy of them. And uh, that can be taken across as a content type. You can have very complex taxonomy in the other system. There's a very good support for taxonomy in SharePoint Online, a central taxonomy store, manage metadata. Um, so uh, you also have system metadata, which is pretty standard, or you're created by, modified by dates. In addition to that, you will have a lot of custom metadata, which again in SharePoint is delivered through the content types and the custom columns that get associated with SharePoint, uh, the content types. So all of this information can quite easily be taken across. The other one is hierarchy. Um, now hierarchy is uh, very different in different systems, the way they structure things. Like documentum starts with a repository, and then you have cabinets, and then folders underneath it. You take FileNet, they start the object store, and then folders, um, similarly open text with library and folders, whereas SharePoint have got a large amount of, uh, it's, it's a vast site collection, so that's how we're going to do lots of lots of site collections. Then sites, if you were looking at the older versions of SharePoint, you would be looking at more of the hierarchical sub-sites and libraries. Now one thing that is uh, important here is, in most systems, the content can be filed in different ways. So it can be filed in a specific location. So just like a library, you go and keep a book, you wouldn't keep, uh, you take a fiction book, put it in that particular author's area, so it has a definite place, whereas, some systems, you can just file it literally nowhere. You throw the document into the system. It doesn't exist anywhere, there is no folder. Um, in fact, we have come across lots of customers who have millions of documents and there is not a single folder. It's there in the system. You just search for it and out there. Uh, and that is where you need to plan when you move into SharePoint because SharePoint, the data has to go into site collections you can't just throw it into the tenant. It needs to be part of a site collection. Not only a site collection, it has to be part of a library. So you need to plan that properly. Libraries have certain limitations. Um, so most of you would be aware of the list view threshold, which now is a lot better in the online world. Still, you cannot take 80 million documents and just throw it into a library. Uh, that is not going to work. So these things have to be thought through before you transition into SharePoint. And for the other variations that we looked at earlier, things like renditions related. Now renditions, again, out of the box, there is no rendition support in SharePoint, but you could make use of things like a document set. That will work well um, uh, as an equivalent for rendition. It's the same with related translation. They all could be clubbed together, uh, related in one way or the other. Now there are some other ways which you can do these things. Um, if you're interested, Maybe after this uh, session, you can, uh, I'm happy to discuss a few of those options with you. It's the same with compound documents. So some of the systems have got compound documents which are related to each other, and same with multi-content document. Uh, this is where a file can have one, not just one, one content, one, one document, but your, uh, an out of is probably a, a good example for that, where the first document is there, and then it can have loads of secondary documents. This can, again, be very easily taken as a, a document set within SharePoint. The other typical challenges you would come across is invalid file names. Uh, now, the extensions, most extensions are supported in online, so that is not an issue. Um, and same with the characters. Most of the invalid characters are now supported, uh, apart from uh, a handful of them, uh, which you might have to consider changing. Now, security. Security works very differently in different systems. Ultimately, the goal is to secure the content, but how you do it can change quite a lot. Uh, some systems might uh, look at it as, um, as simple as, can you read this, can you write, can you access it at all? Some systems are very complex and have, can have a security at very different levels. Uh, the type of security can be different. Um, now, in SharePoint, fortunately, you have a very large set of permission. So if you look at the permission levels, you will notice there are those typical 
full control design edit. But when you look into that, that is formed of lots of different permissions. But what you need to be aware of is not all the permissions might have an equivalent permission. So we need to find what works well and what will serve the business. Uh, so one is uh, the permission for creator group and other uh, users. Uh, some systems have the concept of who creates it, gets a different permission, uh, the group can have a different permission, and then there would be an individual ACL set on that uh, item. Um, another thing that we need to be mindful of is a permission on individual revisions. Some systems allow you to only see version 2 or version 5, uh, whereas in SharePoint, the permission is set on the entire document. So if you can see version 1, you can see even version 5. Um, in some cases like eDocs, uh, open text, you can say uh, person X is allowed to see only the published version, and that's it. Uh, you cannot see the previous versions. Uh, and that, again, uh, you have to be mindful of when you're doing this in, uh, in SharePoint. So we have this uh, scenario where one of the customers using eDocs, uh, so they were controlling all the satellites, um, uh, the Bella satellites, and all the control instructions were in these documents. So the satellite that is currently there, the control operators had access to the published version of the document, so that's the control code. But the people who are working on the newer satellites are about to be launched in three months' time. That was the version 678, but that wasn't published. So if you were to move this document and suddenly give access to that entire version series, suddenly they might be typing in control codes that is meant for a newer version of the satellite, and that would be a disaster. So this is where understanding these kind of, uh, uh, how the permission can be uh, applied at a granular level, does help. Uh, some systems also allow you to view only the metadata <coughs> and not the document. So when you search, you can see, oh, there is uh, a cost proposal for customer X. So you could see that, but when you try to open the document, you will not be able to open the document because you don't have permissions to view the content. Uh, so this, again, is something that SharePoint gives you access to both metadata and the content at the same time, but doesn't split that metadata versus content. Next is information protection. So talking of security, the next thing you could do is to protect it using AIP. So AIP, uh, Currently, AIP is part of the, uh, you can get it uh, as a separate uh, service or as part of the EMS, uh, they also provide uh, AIP. This will help you encrypt the content and secure the content. So it's not just securing, it actually encrypts it. So if you do send it outside the organization, uh, it will still be encrypted. So this, by the way, is information from the Microsoft side. Um, so what you would notice with AIP is, if you want to protect the content as part of a transition, you're better off doing that during the transition. Because once the, once the data ends up in SharePoint and you want to encrypt it, the file actually changes. Uh, the extension changes, it has to be encrypted. So you could potentially lose some of the um, audit information, uh, like the versions that were created, is, that would change. So you could on the fly, make the change, uh, encrypt it, and then move that across. So on the digital workplace, all of this that we're looking at was ultimately to drive the digital workplace. Uh, and the digital workplace, the four main pillars is the desktop, collaboration for the users, the communication between users, and the security to apply them. And these are just some of the services that currently are available as part of M365 to deliver this. A few other user features that typically get uh, missed out during transition is the concept of personal workspace. So people who have used uh, Documentum or eDocs, they have this uh, concept of a personal workspace, a home cabinet, uh, where you could either store your own documents, your own content, or you could have references to content. So you're not making a copy. Within eDocs, in your personal workspace, you would select other areas uh, of documents or folders and then reference that within your system. Um, 
when you want to try and move this onto SharePoint or OneDrive, the last thing you want to do is start duplicating because 10 different individuals might have created a link or the reference to the same document. So when you move a workspace, you don't want to create 10 instances of the same document in 10 different OneDrive or 10 different sites. Um, then you have on the sharing and collaboration side, I think SharePoint is very, very advanced. It's, it's uh, uh, especially with all the recent changes, uh, they're trying to make sharing so much more simpler. So that's uh, something the users will never miss. Uh, enterprise search, uh, I think in today's uh, announcement also, this mentioned how search is so integral to the M365 platform, uh, having the central location to search. So search is uh, a key thing, but what needs to be uh, taken into account is, in some of the systems, you have the ability to save a search. So I could create a search that says, get me all the documents between April and August having this particular metadata, and that will get saved somewhere. And you could go back to that almost like a view on your enterprise content. Uh, that is something uh, out of the box you might not find. Some users ask for it. Many users are happy to adopt uh, the modern way of working. So quickly looking at some of the best practices. So how do you make sure that whatever you're transitioning ends up in the right place and uh, is perfect for the organization? So start with the discovery analysis. This is quite key because it tells you what is, uh, in fact, I'm going to go to the next slide and we'll talk about that. So the discovery and analysis of your uh, current system will give you what the uh, uh, current landscape looks like, what the uh, content size, volume, the uh, distribution, relationship, hierarchy, understanding that will make sure uh, that you can uh, plan for the design for the next phase. The next thing is the data anomaly. Uh, what, uh, what you might not realize is that a lot of data over time uh, people start putting in different kind of data, and some systems are quite strict. They might have the right restrictions in place, but we have seen a lot of times where dates could be from 1900s, you know, documents created in 1900s, or uh, 2055. Uh, so these are all anomalies that need to be taken into account. Um, so if you try to move a date with uh, 1900, you're not going to get that into SharePoint. Uh, or in you know, 1877, some systems have really weird dates, uh, the default dates. So those kind of data anomalies need to be fixed. Then looking at target incompatibility. We already looked at a couple of them, like those different versions, the different extensions, different file names of the versions. These are all incompatibilities between the systems that need to be identified up front. Otherwise, you start moving terabytes of data, and then you would realize that, okay, half the stuff is not going in. Uh, especially uh, if you, uh, think, uh, like, systems like I manage, where people tend to uh, save a lot of email, they tend to have characters that don't uh, fit in well with SharePoint. Uh, so majority of the content will start to then fail. Uh, also, the length of the file name. We have seen files uh, where people drag and drop emails, and the email, for some reason, people have put the entire uh, body of the email in the subject, so it is searchable. Um, so 4,000 characters in a file name, uh, which works fine in Exchange. Uh, or in some systems, because in uh, all these systems it is all virtual naming, it's not a physical name, uh, that works fine. But if you try to move that into SharePoint, you are not going to get a 4,000 character document name into SharePoint. So understanding those target incompatibilities will help you uh, ease the move. Then identifying rot or the redundant obsolete and trivial. There is so much data, and the data is only increasing day by day. Uh, so identifying this will help you make sure you are not moving everything. You might be able to either filter out, delete some stuff that you don't need, or in some cases move something onto cheaper storage, or move them into areas that doesn't need to be in a very collaborative environment. Otherwise, you would end up moving everything for the sake of moving the data. Uh, it's true that in some organizations there are compliance regulations, retention regulations, uh, which dictate that data has to be moved, but you might be able to cleverly move this into different locations uh, so that it's easier for future uh, use. Um, and all of this 
becomes an input into the business decisions uh, of what should get moved, what shouldn't, how it gets moved, inputs into the technical design. Uh, and uh, the, the next thing you want to do is to take this whole discovery and analytics into the next phase. There's a lot of uh, uh, announcement on AI, um, which uh, you would have heard in the keynote uh, today. Uh, so AI is a key thing uh, which uh, will harness uh, the unknown or the dark side of the data uh, in, in, in your system. It can tell you a lot more uh, of, uh, it's not just a standard things like sentiments and uh, other elements that are branded about quite a lot, but more useful things like how the data is clustered, how they're related to each other, things that you might not be able to see straight away that might emerge. So this is one of the slides from the AIMS content survey, uh, which Microsoft worked along with. And you would be surprised to see that um, 41 to 75% uh, of them realize that 29% of the data is uh, not fit for purpose. So it's a lot of data that uh, organizations think that is not really relevant it's obsolete or uh, it's something that they could totally get rid of. Uh, I might look at this demo a bit later, looking at insights. Uh, the next thing is to mitigate your risks. Um, anytime you're moving, the risk to a project is quite critical uh, when there are a lot of unknowns. So the insights that you saw so earlier tells you what to plan for, and, you, and, and the other thing is the need for knowledge of both the systems. Uh, we have worked on several projects where customers have looked into uh, a transition plan. They are experts at SharePoint. They understand SharePoint very well, but the other system is something they don't understand. And when you don't understand the source system, uh, there are lots of things that can get missed out that cannot be planned for. So if you are migrating, you're moving to a new system to M365, make sure you have people who understand both the systems and how things work between these two. Um, then assisting users uh, to step away from the old ways of working. More and more users are so used to working in a particular way, you cannot tell them that, oh, there are better ways to do things. There's Teams, there are uh, other platforms available, stream for video, people don't change that easily. So you have to educate them, you have to constantly, uh, you know, keep telling them what is better, how they can, how these things can make their life easier. Then correct estimation of the migration effort. Now, people think of migration as moving the data or the content from one location to another, but that is not the reality. The reality is there's a lot more to it than that. And that comes down to you know, understanding the true cost of move, because the cost of move includes planning, there's all the infrastructure changes, uh, the impact on user productivity, how to train them, what business downtime is there. Oh. Oh. Some downtime happening here. <laughs> and uh, the data corruption issues, because things move across and if it's not the right data, uh, there is a huge impact on the business. All of this needs to be considered uh, in the cost of migration, in the cost of a transition, so when you build up a plan, uh, you have to factor in all of these things. Uh, the next phase is design and deploy. Now, one key aspect here is when you come to design, the, the middle, the governance aspect is a very important bit. Um, what a lot of people don't realize is Microsoft has provided us this wealth of services in the O365 world, but what is happening behind the scenes? So if you go and create a planner, it all looks nice. I need lots of plans. People might go and start creating planning. But behind the scene, it is creating a site collection. Uh, there is uh, you know, a, a group being created, a security group, an email address. A lot of things are being generated in the background, which people don't realize. And you, know, you start creating things like, oh, I need a planner for HR. Suddenly, your HR site collection is gone. Uh, you can't create a new site collection called HR, or your HR email address has suddenly disappeared. Um, uh, because that's been now reserved for this particular uh, uh, planner. So you need to be aware of these uh, things and put some governance strategy in place for anything that is getting created, any provisioning that's happening. So there is some kind of a naming convention or who can create, uh, how it can be created, what templates, 
so that going forward in five years time, you're not looking at data that is all, uh, all over the place. You can't figure out, uh, was this a plan? Can I delete this site? Is this going to now delete my actual HR site or is it going to delete the HR planner that was created? So that governance part is important. But the most important one at the very top is do not recreate the old system. If you have been using FileNet with one object store, with lots of library, uh, with a lot of folder, don't try to do that in SharePoint. SharePoint has got a lot of better ways of doing things. Uh, it's true, people have been used to looking at the hierarchy of folders and getting to things, but there are much better ways. Uh, there might be teams where you can create multiple uh, in teams or site collections and get that aggregated into one location. Uh, there are many new ways of working, so that has to change. So all of the uh, information architecture that you design has to be relevant. Then ensure your compliance, uh, security, and information protection. Because without this in place, you don't want to move everything and then decide suddenly I've opened up lots of content that was not supposed to be there. Search is very important, so we have to keep that in mind. And uh, the other thing is the various business process. Transition is not just moving data, but it is moving all the various processes that people have been used to. So this slide looks at how you can structure the data uh, based on its level of sensitivity and what kind of services you could use. Uh, so <coughs> if you have what's the baseline data which is not very, which needs minimal protection, they can go into more uh, public uh, environment like Yammer, Stream, um, or uh, the next level is slightly sensitive which is more project related data. They then end up in Teams, Planner, or sometimes uh, users also put in OneDrive and they tend to share. But more corporate-like data, which has to be um, secured very well, but at the same time, many people will be accessing it. Uh, that is typically in SharePoint. Now, Outlook is because people do communication uh, using Outlook uh, with sensitive data. So that also has to be quite secure. But now, a lot of that communication is now happening through Teams. Uh, so organizations that are using Teams widely, you will see there's a one-to-one -one personal chat, where there's team chats within channels, uh, and uh, the services that uh, Microsoft is now providing is making sure that these kind of channels are also protected in addition to your traditional ones. So rethinking the information architecture. As I said earlier, don't recreate. Don't take your object store or a library and then recreate that. Think of a different way. Where there is personal data, use OneDrive. Where there is uh, a short-term content like a project site, use something like Teams, Office 365 rules. Where you have more long-term content, um, like your HR site, your account site, uh, look at SharePoint, and then set up Teams. And where you have more organization-wide content, like your course sites, your portals, your intranet, uh, you have SharePoint, and then use things like Yammer and Stream, uh, so Stream is quite good if you want to uh, set up um, like tutorials or general communication. But one thing you need to be uh, careful of is how do you create a site? Now if, if people who have gone and created sites, you will see those two things come up, your team site and your communication site. Now what you don't realize is if you select the team site, it is going to create a lot of things in the background like what I said earlier which is your, uh, it will create a site collection, but it will also create your security group, email address, it actually creates an O365 group because a modern team site is based on the O365 group. And then you have the communication site. So what I tend to do or when we work with customers is we create a modern site because everything has to be modern. Uh, that's where all the investment from Microsoft is happening. Um, so you can create a modern site but unfortunately, this is only available for admins. Uh, when you go to create Teams and communication, you would see other sites, other uh, templates. When you select that, there is a team site template in there. That will provision a modern team site, which is not backed by Office 365 group. Now, this is useful, especially if you are going to create hundreds of thousands of sites. You don't want uh, the, uh, the groups uh, behind it, so you can create that. Then, based on your usage, if you think that out of my thousand sites I've created, 
hundred of them needs to have groups, you can groupify it. And this, these are not my terminology. Microsoft is using this terminology now. They groupify a particular team site, and then you can teamify it. So on, you can connect a group onto a team, and then you can then take multiple uh, sites and you hubify or create a hub out of it. So you can see the transition happening from a simple bare minimum to based on your um, requirements and how you use it, you keep uh, changing it. And the other bit is once you have your information architecture, you need to enrich your content. So restructuring is an important part of it. Uh, restructuring because it's all going into a flat environment now, so you might want to change everything. Uh, and then reclassification uh, for better categorization, uh, the metadata enrichment, so anything you're adding, get value out of it. So uh, if you have, that's a lot of scanned documents, rather than just uh, taking the document as digital, um, as binaries, blobs, what you could do is you can move them across uh, into more meaningful content by extracting key information. Yeah. And then plan for success. So have user training, very key, uh, wide communication so that people are aware of what's happening, a proper plan to transition, and prepare for the 80-20 rule because uh, the last 20% might seem like a small amount, but that generally takes a lot of time. And prepare for integration with third party systems um, because your system might be working with lots of other things. And make use of the adoption guidance from Microsoft. There's a lot of information on the Microsoft site. Uh, things like, uh, uh, this again is something I picked up from the Microsoft site. Uh, they have uh, Teams adoption um, and uh, you know, a lot of other communication frameworks and things which can be quite useful. Um, so I guess you are, oh, it's almost four o'clock. Do you have any any questions based on what we have just gone through? Um, I'm happy to, I know that it's, we are four o'clock now. Uh, I'm available after the session if anybody needs to discuss this in more detail. Uh, if not, I'll be also at the Preventec booth on booth number 320. Uh, so feel free to drop by and uh, I can give you more details. And if anybody's technical and wants to understand uh, the technical in, uh, details of how this can be done, uh, I'm happy to go through that also. Yeah, good. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.